Good morning from Ford City, Pennsylvania. This is Chuck King on Tuesday, January the 5th, 2021, bringing you Bible study number 295 from a very short chapter of 1 Corinthians 8. We only have 13 verses here. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge, and knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. So now he's going to deal with the issue that was really widespread in the in the Gentile church, which was eating eating food that had previously been sacrificed to idols. And the way we understand it, that the there's so much idolatry and uh, they were sacrificing animals to these idols, but then the the meat would be sold in a in a marketplace afterwards, and this was the issue. There was a a, a good price on meat, uh, and the Christians felt some felt they could they could buy it, and it would it would be fine. But yet we have the background of Acts fifteen, where where the church gathered to decide the, the issue of, of Gentiles obeying the old covenant regulations, including circumcision. And, and the early church leaders, by the direction of the Holy Spirit, decided that the Lord wasn't working anymore through those Old Testament uh, traditions, but he was saving everyone by, by faith alone and by grace. And so they they didn't require the Gentile churches to observe the customs of the Jews, but rather asked them to observe four simple principles that would make their ministry more attractive to the Jews wherever they lived uh, among those nations. And you remember they asked them not to to uh, to sin in fornication or sexual sin. They asked them not to eat food that was strangled or the blood of the animals and or the food that was sacrificed to idols. Now, you might think this was uh, something the Jews came up with to uh, on their own, but we know that in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we have a couple of references to those seven churches. A couple of them are need to repent because they were being influenced by idolatry by eating food sacrificed to idols. And Jesus made it clear that he didn't want them to eat the food sacrificed to idols. Number one, it could be a real problem of idolatry that you you get sucked into, or it could simply be a bad testimony to those who know that you're eating meat sacrificed to idols. So this is kind of the background of this whole issue. And Paul's dealing with it here among the Corinthians. So he talks about uh, knowledge. Having knowledge alone makes a person proud or arrogant, but how the love of God, the fruit of the Spirit, builds people up. Then he continues, verse 2, If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. So now again, he's referencing uh, worldly knowledge, information, and compares that to the, the more important love of God, the agape love of God. And if you think you have knowledge or understand something, uh, you, you need to humble yourself because you really don't understand the way you think you do. But if you love God, if you have agape love for God, then he knows us as well. So the love is always the most important thing, not knowledge or justification uh, that comes from your knowledge. Verse 4, Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols. See, he's talking about eating food sacrificed to idols in context of, of knowledge versus the love of God. So he says, We know, verse 4, that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and there is no God but one. So when you have knowledge of spiritual things, you understand 
that we are in a spiritual warfare, God is sovereign and he has allowed the devil and demonic forces to wreak havoc on the earth and, and cause all kinds of false knowledge and false wisdom to be spread among the people. And he, he also encourages idolatry because he, he wants worship. He doesn't, he doesn't want the one true God to be worshiped. He wants to take that worship away and uh, turn it toward himself, meaning the devil. So, but we know, when we know that, we understand that idols are really nothing. They're just man-made caricatures of some vain imagination of religious worship. And that's what Paul is saying. When it comes to food that was sacrificed to idols, the idols, uh, they, don't, they really don't have any power because there's only, there's only one God who has all authority in heaven and earth, Jesus. Verse 5, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things are, are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. So he focuses on the Father and the Son, meaning everything. They are our first love, our top priority. And even though men have come up uh, with with vain worship of idols, uh, and there are many of them, and you know, for example, I know that in India, they have hundreds of millions of hundreds of millions of gods that they've identified that the people worship. And, and so to add just one more Jesus Christ to that number is not a hard thing, but to have them forsake all and believe only in Jesus, that's the challenge of the church in India, to get people to see there is only one God and he needs to be worshiped. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Verse 7, however, not all men have this knowledge, this knowledge, the knowledge being that the Father and the Son are the only true God that, that we need to worship. All men don't have that knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So now we're talking about someone who was raised in an idolatrous culture and all their lives to this point, they have been involved in idolatry and, and their family and the people around them. So they don't have the knowledge of the one true God and the need to worship Jesus Christ and that idols are really nothing, but they are demonic manifestations uh, fighting against the, the loyalty of the people toward the one true God. Not everybody understands that, but they are, they are still affected by their culture of idolatry. And if they eat food, even from a marketplace that was first sacrificed to an idol, they, they end up having a, a defiled conscience. They feel, and that means they, they feel like they're doing something wrong inside of them. Their conscience, their spiritual man isn't comfortable with eating food offered to an idol because of their past knowledge of idolatry, and they feel defiled and defiled in sin from that. Verse 8, but food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. Now, food has been made an issue throughout history among religious people, but Jesus made it clear, even though the Jews were so focused on clean and unclean and doing what their law and their tradition required of them concerning foods, Jesus, in his ministry, publicly told them that, that all things are clean. And we know that, we know that the scripture says that, uh, that as long as uh, the, the food is sanctified by the word and prayer, it is clean. And the, that which a person eats doesn't defile him, but it's what comes out of his heart that defiles him. So this is what Paul is talking about. Eating certain food 
or rejecting certain food doesn't draw us closer to God. Uh, and that's what he said. We're no, we're no worse if we eat, we don't eat, and nor, nor better if we do. Verse 9. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Now, remember Paul talked about the freedom that we have in, in Christ. He mentioned that in, the, in an earlier chapter. Uh, verse, this is chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by them. There is there is liberty that Christians have because they're not bound by the laws of, of uh, religion that, that required them to eat or not eat certain things. And that's what he's talking about, about here, that we, we have liberty, but we've got to be careful that the freedom that we have in Christ doesn't cause a stumbling block to those who whose knowledge or understanding or whose conscience won't allow them cannot participate like we feel that we have the freedom to do. This is the whole issue here. Verse 10, for if, someone's, if someone sees you who have knowledge, again, that term knowledge means that we understand that there's only one one God and we worship him and it's not idols that should control us nor the issue of food offered to idols, but we have freedom in Christ. And uh, that's, that's uh, we have feel that we can eat this food. And Paul's saying, he's saying that that liberty could cause someone to stumble because if somebody sees you, who feels they have the freedom to eat this food offered to idols. It says dining in an idol's temple. There must have been a, a restaurant there. And the food must have been good and it must have been reasonable. Uh, or, or why would they eat there? That seems to be the inference. But if someone sees you eating there, will not his conscience, the person who thinks it's wrong to eat that food, if he is weak, and, and Paul identifies the person who has less liberty who feels constrained not to eat this food as the weaker one, weaker one in faith. He, he identifies the stronger one, the one who has a greater understanding of what God is doing to have the liberty to do uh, what the other person thinks they shouldn't as far as eating the food. If, but if the man is weak, uh, he, uh, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols. So Paul is saying that, if someone who, who uh, is defiled in their conscience by eating food sacrificed to idols because of their background, if they see you who feel they have the freedom to eat this food dining in a, in a temple restaurant, well, well, they might be emboldened or feel that they have the freedom to do the same thing. But then if they eat it, then they, they feel like they've sinned. You see, what the problem here, that's what the stumbling block is, that by my freedom, I do something that causes someone else to be influenced by my example to do the same thing. But at the end, they feel defiled by that experience, and therefore they've, they've sinned. Verse 11, for through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. So Paul describes a scenario when we can cause another brother in Christ or another sister in Christ to fall into sin by eating the food that we feel comfortable eating, but they they don't feel it's right. But our example has caused them to join our practice of eating food sacrificed to idols. And Paul says that that, that ruins, the term here in the New American Standard is ruins the brother, causes him to stumble. Verse 12, and so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. So he's saying, look, the freedom that you think you have, you better be careful that you don't have a bad testimony in front of other Christians, true Christians, who, who don't feel they have the freedom to do what you are doing and uh, and, and doing so publicly in a in a. a a restaurant in an, in an idol's temple, eating food sacrificed to idols, and that causes the the weak brethren to to have a wounded conscience because they follow your example. 
Paul says we sin against the Lord when we cause people to stumble by eating food offered to idols. We cause others to stumble, and that's an offense to Christ. Verse 13, therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. So Paul, this is part of his, his, uh, his way of living. Remember, he said, I become all things to all men that I might save some. So he was willing to adapt his personal habits and behavior to the culture he was trying to reach with the gospel. And he's saying here that if I know I am in a place where food sacrificed to idols was a, a stumbling block that I shouldn't eat meat at all in case I would cause them, the other Christians, to stumble and so wound them and uh, by, by doing so sin against Christ. Now we know, uh, even though Paul argues for the freedom throughout his writings, freedom of Christians to follow their conscience and uh, to have liberty to do certain things, especially with, with food and drink, we know that he also gives us this warning not to be a stumbling block. And surely this must be what is on the heart of the Lord when he led the those early apostles and elders in Jerusalem to give that that uh, policy direction for Gentile believers not to eat food sacrificed to idols. And Jesus affirms that to the churches in Revelation. He, he confirms that was his will by the, his statements to the churches who have violated this principle. And Jesus called them the repentance. So we know that Paul is giving a, more of a complete view here, not just don't do it, but he's explaining. He's explaining to the, the Christians why eating food sacrificed to idols could cause other Christians to fail in their personal walk. And there are, there are things uh, that in our modern culture that we can probably apply to this uh, same teaching of eating food offered to idols is not a, an issue here in the United States, but it, it could be in other nations, very same issue. But I think of one that uh, that is very clear, that even though the use of, of wine in the Bible was uh, practiced, we know that any abuse of that alcohol would be sinful, drunkenness, excessive use, would be considered worldly and carnal and therefore sinful, but it doesn't forbid the use of wine. But in our culture today, in the United States especially, and this is true in many cultures as well, there, there have been so many abuses of alcohol in the culture, a widespread alcoholism and wickedness associated with the use of alcohol, that for Christians to to use alcohol in front of other Christians could be a similar stumbling block, especially if those Christians who felt it was wrong to drink would, would give in and drink alcohol because the other Christians were doing it, and they could find themselves becoming an alcoholic, for example. You know, some people can become alcoholics by taking one drink of alcohol. And that's why I always caution Christians not to drink. Because there's no advantage, uh, spiritual advantage or physical advantage to drinking alcohol, especially when it can bring a stumbling block before people and maybe cause them to fail and fall away from the Lord. So this is why I think that it's better for Christians never to drink alcohol in the United States. Practically speaking, almost all of us have had alcohol abuse in our, in our family heritage. And we might be susceptible to that abuse and become alcoholics and destroy ourselves. But secondly, we might, we might influence some other Christians to use alcohol and it might, it might destroy them. So this is a short chapter, but we've covered the difference between having knowledge of, of what we can do and demonstrating the love of God so that we don't cause people to stumble over 
our behavior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this short chapter 8 and ask your wisdom and understanding for every one of us so that we can apply this, this teaching on knowledge and love so that we can understand that, to, that knowledge of things can actually make us arrogant and proud, whereas the love of God causes us to always care for you and for other people, and that we should be careful of the way we live and how we behave uh, in all things so that we don't cause other Christians to stumble. And Father, help us to love and forgive each other even when there is offense so that your body can become that pure and spotless bride walking in unity that you want us to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there, there's chapter 8, only 13 verses, but we managed to have uh, over 20-minute Bible study. Lord bless and keep you. Please share these teachings on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, again, every day I exhort you to be strong in the Lord and use the wisdom of God so that you can uh, please him in every everything and be ready for his coming uh, or the day when he takes you home. And I pray that you would be in good health and prosper even as your soul prospers. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless.